Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. And today, we have a rare treat. We have Jane Castor, Tampa City Police Chief. It's really nice to be able to call you Chief Castor now. The last time we were together, it was Assistant Chief. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? I am so delighted that the City of Tampa made the right decision. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You have how many people in your force? How, how big a force is it? We have about 1,300. We have just under 1,000 police officers and then about 300 in uh, support, civilian support role. When you do the city of Tampa, what kind of relationship is there with the sheriff's department? I, I, I see their cars in the city uh -huh. of Tampa, so there's obvious, and their headquarters is in the city of Tampa. Right. So how does the policing get shared? amongst those two organizations? Actually, the way it gets shared is that the sheriff, David G., is the chief law enforcement officer. So he has jurisdiction throughout Hillsborough County, and they have process servers that come into the city. And then, obviously, three cities within uh, City of Tampa, Temple Terrace, and Plant City. And then I'm in charge of the City of Tampa, but we have a great relationship with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, and unfortunately, that's not the case nationwide. It's rare that a municipality and a sheriff's office get along the way that we do, but we, in essence, run as, as one organization. Uh, we went on the sheriff's office radio system several years back, oh, really? and they just recently went on to our records management system. So what that means is the criminals have no place to hide. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it really is a great relationship. We work together every day on issues that keep our community safe. So it's a big win for all of the citizens to, to be residents of the city of Tampa or Hillsborough County. You get uh, a great law enforcement relationship. What do you think engenders that relationship? Well, I believe it, it begins at the top. You know, the fact that the sheriff and I get along very, very well. We have the city of Tampa and our Tampa Police Department, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, all of our high liability policies uh, mirror each other, you know, pursuit policies, deadly force, use of force, taser usage, they're all exactly the same. So we really? can say this is how law enforcement functions in Hillsborough County. And again, it begins at the top, but it's those relationships all the way down to the street that make it work on a daily basis. And I believe what it is is that all of the deputies and police officers work towards the same goal, and that's keeping our community safe. You know, it's strange, and, and I'm no different than most people that watch the police department <laughs> and watch television. But, you know, we see this animosity between the feds and the right. locals and the locals and the sheriff's department yeah. and all of this. But it doesn't have to be, obviously. It doesn't have to be, and unfortunately, that is the case in so many places. And not only do we have a great working relationship with all of the local law enforcement in Pinellas County and throughout Hillsborough County, but we also have great relationships on the state level with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the Florida Highway Patrol. And then, as I always jokingly say, nobody talks to the feds. We have great relationships with every federal agency. And that was um, displayed uh, probably most prominently when we had Officer Curtis and CoCab killed in the line of duty. And when Mayor Iorio and myself, uh, when we left the hospital and went out to the command post, there were probably close to 20 agencies there. And we never asked anybody to come. They all came. And wow. we knew what their strengths were. We knew what they could do mm -hmm. to help us in that manhunt. And everybody went about working at what their strengths were in order to bring that individual into custody. You know, looking at you, it, the question comes up in my mind very quickly. How many female police chiefs are there of major police departments? Because I, I look around and, and yeah. I don't see a whole lot. Yeah, there aren't, uh, there aren't many. There was uh, until... Um, some months back, it was just Kathy Lanier, who is the chief in, in Washington, D.C., and has been the chief, I believe, for about five years. Uh, but So it was just she and I. And actually, you we have, have your a, own little group? It's funny. I'll tell you a funny story because we have a, we're, we're resemble each other physically. Uh, you know, she's tall and has blonde hair. And I was in Washington, D.C. for the National Law Enforcement Memorial Ceremony 
and I was walking in my staff uniform and a group of her officers picked me up in a van thinking that I was <laughs> her. So when I saw her, I told her that I changed several policies at her department. I hope she didn't mind, but they, they quickly realized that it wasn't. But um, recently, uh, we have um, Janae Harto, who was appointed as the chief of police in Minneapolis, and then uh, the chief of police in Columbus, Ohio, is a woman as well. So we're looking at four? Yeah, right. Well, we're, we're making... Have you guys hey, your doubled. own little club we've already? <laughs> Actually, we do have a, a women's law enforcement uh, executive group that I belong to and, and mentor young women on their way up. So. Are there a number of women in the assistant chief positions around the country where, there are, where they are moving mm -hmm, up? There are. The barrier being broken? Yes, there are. But, uh, you know, it, it's... Um, uh, there are a lot of elements that go into it. You know, some of it you have to be in the right place at the right time, and then it's, you know, your skill set. There, there's a lot that's involved in that. And in law enforcement, historically, there's not a lot of room for upper, upward mobility. Our staff is lean and mean. You know, for a department our size, we only have five majors and two assistant chiefs for 1,300 employees. Wow. So yeah, so there's not a, a lot of uh, mobility, you know, up to that position. A lot so. of companies would be envious of that kind oh, of record. Right, I know. And and it's not that we don't have a lot of qualified women, but again, the opportunity has to present itself. With that many people, with 1,300 people, do you have to do a lot of training? We do a great deal of training in our department, and that's very important whenever there are budgetary cuts. One of the first areas to be cut usually is training, and that is the most important area that you need, especially in law enforcement, because things are changing day to day as far as legislation, statutes, laws, but also uh, just to keep the officers refreshed. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, different tactics, techniques that they can use, that run the gamut, not just things that you would think of, that you have to train with your firearm, you have to train in driving, uh, you know, things, interrogation skills, um, social skills, you know, getting the community involved in crime fighting, relationships. There's just a, a myriad of topics that need to be covered. And we always look at new ways to provide that training. Like now with the budgetary cuts, you really can't send people away for training. So Sheriff G and I, have gotten together and collaborated on bringing speakers into the Tampa Bay area so we can send as many of our personnel to that that instructor as possible. That is so much yeah. more intelligent right. than sending people off. Right, and, and you and can send one or two individuals off where you can bring the instructor in and train hundreds. Well, and there's a whole different thing. I, I am a professional instructor. I've done seminars for every major DOD agency in the United mm -hmm. States and some foreign countries. And it is easier and better for me to go into an organization mm -hmm. where I can look at the culture of that organization, tailor what I'm going to say to that particular city, area, command, Correct. than having 50 people from, from 50 different, different organizations right. say, here's a cookie cutter seminar for mm -hmm. you. Right. And you all take away from it whatever will fit in your area. Uh -huh. And then you have to depend on that individual to take you know, back and, and communicate that. Well, not only that, but they, if, if you send 50 people from your organization and I take them through stress management mm -hmm. or whatever I take them through, those 50 learn the rules. Right. And they take it back and they work together on those rules. If, I, if you send two to an outside seminar, they come back, nobody else has learned the rules. Right. <laughs> so they find it difficult to apply. So I think what you're doing is mm -hmm. extremely intelligent and very, very far-sighted. Well, More good, in that case, I'll to. take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, we have uh, uh, David G. and I have a great working relationship. He is phenomenal. He really uh, is. I really have great respect for David. And he's a fascinating individual. If you talk to him, all of the things that he does, he's an accomplished pilot. He's, he's a fascinating individual. I, uh, I look forward to getting him on this program again. He's been so busy getting him on right. is, a, is a very yeah, difficult he thing. Is busy. You mentioned firearms trainings. Let's jump a little bit to firearms. What training is required of your officers in firearms? Well, we have a, there's a state mandated <clears throat> qualification course that officers have to go through. And they only have to go through that 
I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it's every five years that the state mandates. We put our officers through qualifications every year. And then we provide training dates where they can go out to the range. We provide ammunition and an instructor, and they can go through uh, the qualification course. And then we also do training. For example, uh, we do um, active shooter training. And so we have fire the officers with the firearms, but obviously paint balls in those. And then we put them in real life scenarios, you know, get that adrenaline pumping, make them uh, uh, make decisions, quick decisions based on facts that are presented to them uh, immediately. So that's very, that kind of training is very, very effective. And we also have uh, our officers are allowed to carry rifles and shotguns on duty, but they have to be proficient with that and they have to train on a, on a regular basis to show that proficiency. I, uh, in, our, in the interest of full disclosure, I have, I have owned a weapon since I was four years old. Four years old, my goodness. I, I grew up on a farm in Canada and you did everything early uh, up there. I'll bet. But, but the, so I, I have no fear of weapons. Mm -hmm. I fear of idiots with weapons. <laughs> I think that's everybody's fear. And, and I, I believe in the castle keep. Mm -hmm. I, I think you should be able to protect your home. Mm -hmm. But it also scares me that how easy it is to get a concealed weapon permit in this state. Mm -hmm. and, and their state bragging on they've got more concealed weapons permits than any other state in the union or yes. something that I've mm -hmm. With all these people carrying weapons out there who have had almost no training, as far as I know, you don't even have to fire on a range to mm -hmm. get that permit. Yeah. How, how does that do with your officers? Well, there are, and it, it's funny, we just had this discussion in our staff meeting this morning about um, the number of firearms that we confiscate on a daily basis. And it just seems like everyone has a firearm out there. And that's one of the things that I talk to groups when they ask me about that. Obviously, I have no issue with someone protecting themselves, their home, their family, uh, with a firearm but they have to be proficient in the use of that. If you look at statistically police officers, law enforcement in general, all of the training that we go through, right. and our hit ratio is not that high. And if you have someone who doesn't know how to use the firearm that they have, and they're put in a situation, the majority of the time that firearm is gonna be taken away from them and either used on them or stolen. So people need to, buying a firearm does not make you safer. You have to, number one, you have to know that you can use it when the time comes. And will and, use it. And you have to, to be prepared, you have to be trained in order to do that. I, I noticed even in New York City, two police officers taking down a felon with a mm -hmm. weapon hit nine bystanders. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if two well-trained trained professionals right. Uh, how safe does it make the streets? I keep hearing from my friends that are, are NRA, oh, but it makes the streets safer to have all those guns out there. Yeah. Not sure. No, I disagree with that as well. And also I see, and as do all other law enforcement officers, we see the damage that comes from uh, unintended consequences of firearm ownership where they put a gun and think the children don't know where it's at. I can tell you through my 29 years in law enforcement, I've seen way too many children shot with a firearm accidentally or adults accidentally shot as well. I can fully believe that. Yeah. You, you mentioned 29 years. Let's talk a little about <laughs> Chief Jane Castor up close and personal. You've been with the police department now 29 years. Correct. That's a pretty good career in itself. Yeah, I think I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think one of the very unique things and wonderful things here is that you actually came up from the bottom, mm -hmm. through the ranks, in the same department, and become chief. Correct. How does Correct. one do that? Well, I don't think that there's any recipe for that. And I'm not sure that there are many people that come into law enforcement with the idea of becoming the chief of police. I know I certainly didn't, um, although, you know, when I had five years on and I thought I knew everything there was to know, <laughs> I would say, make me chief, I'll change this place. But, uh, you know, you come in to serve and protect. You know, you come in to be a police officer and all that that involves. 
And frankly, the further you move up the ranks, the, the less police work you do. Or as my kids, I do the uh, Great American teaching at my boys' uh, school every year. And when they were in the fifth grade, they told the entire group that my mom's not a real cop. She's just a chief. She doesn't put <laughs> bad guys in jail. She just sits behind a desk. So that sums up my career right there. But uh, really, you do miss that. You know, I, I, I miss being out there on the street and the, the, the excitement and the ability to, to affect positive change on the, the most basic level, you know, protecting those individuals that, that can't help themselves. Speaking of the, the boys, <laughs> uh, the story you told me last time on the air, I, I have repeated to other people. <laughs> And I want to be sure I'm telling it right, so I'm going to let you retell it. Oh. You're, you're a basketball star at UT. It used to be. I went through college on, a, on an athletic scholarship at University of Tampa. Athletic, uh, I mean, uh, basketball and volleyball. So my boys go to camps at University of Tampa, soccer and basketball. So I go to pick them up one day, and they're like, Mom, your picture's outside. So they go, come quick, come quick. So I go out there. They make me shut my eyes. They're like, look, it's you, it's you. And I said, I know. I said, I've, I've been inducted into the University of Tampa's Hall of Fame. And so my one boy says, well, Mom wants that number on the ball. And so I proudly let them know that I scored 1,000 points during my career. And without hesitation, my one boy goes, ooh, Mama, you didn't pass the ball. <laughs> so <laughs> here he is calling me a ball hog. And so that was, the end of his, uh, that was the end of any of his camps at that uh, university. Yeah, they're entertaining. I tell you, there's nothing to bring you down to earth quicker than children. No, that's they, the they, truth. They tell you the Absolutely way it is, right. uh, you know, no sugar coat, no nothing. They just bring you right down. Let's talk a little bit about television versus real police work. Uh -huh. Touched on it just a few minutes ago, but, but let's go back to that. Let's talk about DNA testing, for mm -hmm. instance. Every time I watch a t TV show, they're getting DNA and, and it's coming back in uh, 24 hours and, or less and they've got this guy all wrapped up and it takes you a lot longer than that an hour show to right. wrap up your cases. Why? Yeah. That's why I tell everybody we, we don't wrap everything up in 30 minutes with commercial breaks. It doesn't happen <laughs> that way. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit different out there on the street and the, the downside of that is that the public's expectations sometimes are um, uh, artificially elevated that they think that the officers can just walk out to their car and they have you know DNA testing and and photograph databases and the th all of those types of things and and law enforcement has advanced dramatically when it comes to technology and we have an outstanding relationship with the Ford Florida Department of Law Enforcement they have a regional lab and that's where we send everything for DNA testing and that has advanced um, uh, very, very quickly over the last decade. And we can get DNA, touch DNA, it's called, from just about any surface at this point. But it's not you know, a 30-minute process. It takes weeks to get DNA samples back. And then if we ask for a rush in a particular, if it's a homicide or a high profile pattern cases, mm -hmm. those types of things, then the FDLE can get that back to us in, in a matter of days, usually about a week. With at least days, but that's very not 24 quick. hours. No, definitely not 24 hours. And then you have to have something to compare that DNA to. It, you know, the individual, the suspect's um, DNA has to be in some, some type of database or we have to have a suspect that we can, we can voluntarily get a sample from, or we can uh, uh, generate a subpoena and get a court-ordered sample of, for DNA testing. But it's, it's very effective. Um, the DNA takes a lot of the, the guesswork out of it, and there's a lot of... Um, I guess there's been a lot of cases reversed. Yes. And, there, and, and innocent people leaving mm -hmm. jail as a result of it, which is good. Right. And there's been a lot of research done on eyewitness testimony, and we're finding out more and more that that, that isn't as reliable as once thought. And there were a lot of individuals that have been convicted on eyewitness testimony and then DNA comes back years later and, and indicates that that isn't the suspect. And that's why when we look in our cases, when we investigate a case, you, you, know, you, don't, you look at a number of different areas. You, know, you don't just get an eyewitness 
testimony or identification from a photo pack and then go with that as your sole piece of evidence. You have to have other elements that, that support a conviction, especially when you're taking someone's freedom away. But when it comes to looking at people being eyewitnesses, it's not really all that reliable. Mm -hmm. It's not, and there has been a great deal of, of uh, research that has been done along those areas, and, and we've worked with the Innocence uh, Commission out of New York, and we have now what we call, in the past, a, an investigator would show a photo array or what people think of as a lineup of six photographs, and someone would pick a suspect from those photographs. And we've gone now to what's called a blind sequential, and you have someone who is uninvolved with the case mm -hmm. show the photographs oh. to the witness so that they, they play no part. Body they language, don't even know who the individual is. Which it is, is themselves. Right. So I never even that. thought of that, but yes. Right. If I'm, if I want you to pick this one, right, I, and and even unintended. Yeah, you know, no, but, but right. it, I'm concentrating on this one. Uh -huh. Are you sure? <laughs> and then we show the photographs sequentially, and show them to the individuals. And there's a great deal of again the research continues, and um, we're even looking at now where it will be a computer display, and it will tape the individual, the witness, or the victim and it will tape their reaction, and it will also tape how long it takes them to make that identification. And studies oh, okay. show that the quicker you make the identification, the more accurate it more may accurate. be. Now, none of this is you know, sure. etched in stone, and it continues to change, but it's a, it really is a fascinating uh, field. And mm -hmm. you know, do, we, we want to make sure we have the right people when you're taking somebody's freedom away. Oh, right. yeah. McGee on NCIS, of course, one of my favorite <laughs> programs, Whenever they go out, he takes his little thing and he goes like that, and it goes back to the lab, and they say, "Oh, it's John Smith." Yeah. Is is that yeah, real? Yeah, actually, we do have uh, we do have those uh, print readers. Um, very few of those, but we do have those out there, and they will go back to a, a database, whether it's a, a prison database or local jails. Those types what, of things. What about the photo recognition programs? They they put those up and they go. <laughs> Yes. And all of a sudden, ah, they got them. Those are very accurate, but they, they're they accurate in a, as, as we call it, in a, a cattle shoot environment. Like, for example, if you have an airport where people are coming through a security screening mm -hmm. and you can get a full frontal shot of someone, it's very um, effective with driver's license databases. It's not as effective in crowds because you have to zoom in on a particular individual and then you you have to get a you know a perfect steady front view of them so in the crowds i'm sure that that is advancing and getting better and better but currently the facial recognition is most effective if you have a, a you know a front view i've got some more things that i'd like to ask you but <laughs> do you have anything that you'd like to tell the people in the Hillsborough County area who are going to watch this. And actually, it'll be online, so it'll be national. So, wow. Well, one of the things when you brought back about the, uh, brought up about the, um, the difference between the television shows and, and real life law enforcement, we have, and I know the Sheriff's Office does as well, a very liberal ride along program. So anyone that wants to come and ride along with a police officer and see exactly what happens, uh, you just have to fill out some forms, go through a, a, a very quick background check, and then you can ride along with an officer wherever you want. Really? You know, and we happen to be open 24 hours a day, so you can ride any time frame, any location. And that's, um, that's uh, always an eye-opener for individuals to go through. And we have a Citizens Academy as well. Twice a year, we put 30 individuals through Citizens Academy, and it's kind of an abbreviated uh, law enforcement academy. And they get to see everything that goes into being a police officer. And that's, uh, that's quite an eye-opener as well. And um, we're getting ready to start one of those. So there's a lot of opportunities for the public to kind of, you know, get below the surface on how the police department See more. works. And it, it really is very, very interesting. A lot I've of never, transparency. Yeah, never had anybody that's gone on a ride along that wasn't entertained, informed, and uh, educated. What would you say to a young person thinking about police work today? 30 years ago, 
yeah. something made you go that route. Right. What would you say to them? Well, I do. I, I do uh, <coughs> guest lectures at uh, the University of South Florida, uh, Hillsborough Community College, and University of Tampa. And I, I talk to the young kids, and I tell them that law enforcement isn't for everyone. But if it is for you, then it is. I've never had a day that I didn't want to come to work. But um, one of the ways I describe law enforcement is you get to see things nobody else gets to see, but you have to see things that nobody should have to see. You see you know, some of the worst of, of humanity out on the streets, but um, you get to make a difference. And it's, uh, it's, it's not a job, it's more of a way of life. So you have to come and make sure, do a ride along. We make all of our applicants do ride along so that they, they have a, a feeling idea. for you're what thinking they're getting about into. It. Yeah, so they, they have a realistic idea of what they're getting into. Well, I have to tell you that 30 minutes has gone by really fast again. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want you to come back a little faster than the last time. All right, I will certainly try to. I've got a to. lot of other questions yeah. I'd love to ask you. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important that these young people learn to look at the police officer mm -hmm. as a friend. Right. And not as an adversary. And right. unfortunately, the police officer, on the other hand, coming into a situation is always looking for the potential danger for himself. Correct. So Correct. you have both of them looking at each other a little leery, and it's kind of nice to see a program whereby you two can get together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, we are starting this year, we're actually starting a youth academy as well, where we're going to bring young adults and put them through. Will you the come academy. back and talk about that? I certainly will. I'd love to. Chief Jane Castor. Tampa Police Department, one of five, or four actually, <laughs> top police department chiefs in the whole country. Thanks for coming with us. You're unique, you're special, and you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know, and we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. And Chief Castor, thanks again for being with me. My pleasure, thanks for the opportunity. information is a nightmare. It's all in how you look at it. To you, it's a pile of books. I'm reading until your eyes drop out. But to me, I go straight to NIHSeniorHealth.gov, click on what I want, and boom, there it is. NIHSeniorHealth.gov, the medical website created with older adults in mind by the National Institutes of Health. Getting health information at our age is tough. Yeah, it's all how you look at it. To you, it's a pile of books and reading till your eyes drop out. But me, I go to NIHSeniorHealth.gov, click on what I want, and bingo, there it is. Well, thanks for the tip. NIHSeniorHealth.gov. It's easy to use, you can make the text bigger, make the contrast better, even make it talk to you. If only everything else out there were senior friendly. NIHSeniorHealth.gov, built with you in mind.